All right, well, Merry Christmas. I hope you guys are doing well. I want to welcome you to Life Point Fellowship Church. Uh, my name is Alex Villard. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to invite you this coming Saturday to our Christmas Eve candlelight service. It's at 6 p.m. I hope you guys can uh, be here and join us. Invite a friend, family. We're going to have a great time celebrating Christmas. Next Sunday, we will not have church. So if you show up, you're going to be here by yourself. So um, just spend some time with your family. It's a, it's, a, it's a good day to give our volunteers a break. And then on the 1st, we're only going to have one service. It's going to be the 11 o'clock service, okay? But we will see you this coming Saturday at, what time did I say? 6 p.m. So we'd love to see you as we celebrate Christmas. Okay, we're... Um, We're in the middle of a a series called Never Alone. Everybody say, Never Alone. Never Alone. Never Alone is the the name of the series. And let me tell you where we're headed today, where we're going today. Um, I believe with all of my heart that if you are a Jesus follower, if you are a believer, you are never alone. And we're going to focus with this this one word or a phrase, in the strangest of seasons okay you're never alone in the strength of seasons have you ever have you ever gone through a time in your life when things were just weird like have you ever done weird like do you know what i'm talking about like i'm not necessarily speaking about a time of like where you had you you went through a great need you know we talked about that in the first week of the series i'm not talking about a time where you needed clarity like you were in the fog of war, and you just, you know, there were some fears that you were dealing with. That was last week. Hopefully, you can go back and listen to the message on YouTube. I'm talking about those times when things are good. You, you still have a job. You have good health. You really don't have anything necessarily to, to complain, but you still feel like there's something missing. And you kind of like try to pinpoint it, and, and I don't know how it is for you, but it's like, You almost feel guilty complaining. You know, you feel like you're complaining. And it's like, I have a job. I have a beautiful family. Things are going. I mean, everything's tracking along. But you still feel like there's just something in my heart. There's just something in my soul that just a missing piece. There's just something that, and it's hard to figure out exactly what it is. But you, the best word that I can come up with is just like, this is just a weird season for, for me. If you've ever felt like that, then um, I'm so glad that you are here, so glad you're listening to the message, because we're going to talk about how to deal with those strange seasons of life. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 39, and so uh, most verses will be on the screen, so you don't have to worry about that, but if you want to follow along, um, Luke chapter 1, verse 39 I'm reading from the New Living Translation. If you have your Bible app and you want to read the same translation that I'm reading. Um, In the story that we're looking at today, there's a lot of strange things that are going on. Lots of weird things, okay? Um, Mary, for example, Jesus' mom, she is, she's pregnant, okay? And uh, we read a few of the verses earlier. She's pregnant and, uh, or she's, yeah, she's pregnant. She's um, with baby Jesus, but... Um, she has never had sex before. And uh, I don't know about you, but that's a strange thing, okay? You have Elizabeth, uh, her cousin, who's also pregnant. She is 88 years old. And um, that's another strange thing, by the way, right? <laughs> like, I don't know about you, but like our kids are a little bit grown now. My sister, who's seven years younger, she's got younger kids, and I often wonder, man, I don't think that I could handle having kids like all over again. I'm glad we're past that season, and we still have kids. We haven't given them up, you know? We still have kids, but I'm talking about little ones, right? Can you imagine being 80, 80 years old and finding out that you're pregnant? Boy, that's, that's crazy. It's, it's weird, actually. It's a strange thing having a baby in your late 80s. Uh, I'll tell you something else that's strange. In a very short period of time, you have angelic, this angelic being, it's, it's um, uh, the angel Gabriel, coming to Mary, but he's not just coming to Mary. He also showed up and he talked to her relatives, Zechariah and Elizabeth. 
and he's given them a message. And you know, it's one thing to experience a personal, um, like, like I don't know if you've ever had like an encounter with God, like see something really personal, and it was just a little bit weird, but it was very real, very raw. And and I don't know about you, but like it, it's one thing for that to happen to, like if it happened to me personally, but it's a whole nother level of weirdness if you find out that this personal encounter that you had actually happened to your relative and so that's weird too so the angel is not just showing up to mary he's showing up to mary's relative and so there's a lot of strange things going on but i want us to um i want us to read the passage for today and so you can see it for yourself so let's begin in verse 39 luke chapter 1 verse 39 it says this a few days later so this is a few days after the angel showed up and told Mary, hey, you're pregnant with baby Jesus, okay? So just a few days later, after that happened, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived. This is um, Elizabeth's husband, Elizabeth, Mary's cousin. She entered the house, Mary entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. Now, I wonder if Mary ran to Zechariah and Elizabeth because she was so confused. We talked a little bit about this last, last week, that Mary was confused and disturbed. When this angel shows up, she like, it's not computing in her brain, okay? Like, she, she doesn't understand. Of course, she's a, a teenage girl. She doesn't, like, she's never seen an angel before. I mean, as far as what we know from Scripture. And so, I wonder, I don't know, the Bible doesn't really say it, but I wonder if she just took off running because Zechariah was a Jewish priest. And Elizabeth, the Bible says, in verse 6, if you look in your Bibles, it says that she was a righteous person. She was righteous in God's eyes. She was careful, careful, and I'm quoting, careful to obey all of God's commandments. And I wonder if Elizabeth, if Mary was so confused that she said, man, I got to run to someone that may, that could potentially can help me interpret what this angel has said to me because this is the strangest thing that's ever said to me. I haven't, you know, like I haven't had sex. I'm, I'm keeping myself pure for, for my husband, my future husband, and the, the angel is saying that I'm going to have, you know, baby Jesus. Now, how could that be? And so Mary just goes, and uh, is trying to get some, some advice from Zechariah, who's kind of like a pastor, right? He's like kind of like, like a Jewish rabbi, um, a Jewish priest and um and so in the whole story i'm not going to read it all because it's it's it would take too long to get to it but mary shows up to elizabeth's house knocks on her door and they have an exchange and you know they greet one another they they say several things you can read it on your own sometime i just want to focus on verse 49 and verse 50 okay this is something that i've never seen before I've read this passage hundreds of times, especially around Christmas. And this week, this last week, was the first time when I read it, I said, wow. Like, I have never seen this before, and I want to show it to you. Mary looks at Elizabeth, and in this very strange, very weird season of her life, she says these words. Verse 49, she says, for the mighty one, that this is God, okay? Mary's speaking to Elizabeth. She's saying, for the mighty one is holy. In that moment of just where everything's just like does not make sense. She says, the mighty one is holy. He has done great things for me, Mary says. He shows mercy. Watch this, don't miss it. He shows mercy mercy everybody say mercy he shows mercy mercy you know what mercy is right when you do something that you're not supposed to do you get in trouble you get found out and the person that could give you some can can let you have it restrains back they say you know what i'm i'm gonna show some mercy i'm not gonna give you what you deserve okay you when my, my kids were little, if they disobeyed, we had something called direct disobedience. If we told you not to touch it, and you touch it, immediately it was like, you know, a slap in the hand, okay? And that was just, Leah and I just called it direct disobedience, right? But there were times when we would just hold back, okay? That's mercy. The Bible says that, and you'll see it here in a little bit, that none of us are perfect, okay? None of us deserve God's grace. And yet, there are times when God 
you know, because he's a just God, he's a holy God, we should be punished. There are times when God says, you know what, I'm not, I'm going to withhold myself, okay? And Mary says, he, this God that she's talking about, shows mercy from generation to generation to all, and here's the key word, to all who what? Fear him. To all who fear him. Now, I want this, I want these verses to penetrate your heart today. I really believe that there's a promise here that wasn't just for Mary, but it's for you today. And if you're going through a strange season in, in, this, in this moment, I, I really believe that this is, this is a promise that God has for you. Can we read verse, can, let's back up. I want to read this together, okay? And, and when we say, when, when, you, when we read that part, for me, I want you to kind of receive the promise. As if it, like God is here in this moment and he's speaking to you, every single one of you. All right, let's read it together. Let's read it to, uh, in unison. Um, and I want you to read it with enthusiasm, okay? So everybody together on the count of three. One, two, three. For the mighty one is holy. He has done great things for me. Verse four, uh, 50. Verse 50. Next slide. There we go. There's verse 50. There you go. <laughs> that was so quick. I was like, okay. You guys are on top. You guys give it up for the media team. Those guys, I mean, they're on top of it. It's hard to follow me. Um, I don't know how they do it. He shows, let's read it together. Ready? One, two, three. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. So this idea of fear, this idea of respect, um, all like you have you hold him in high regards you honor him and the question naturally is asked am i supposed to be afraid of god it's a good question to ask right am i supposed to like anytime we read in the bible about the fear of the lord i don't know if you've ever asked, like am i supposed to be afraid of god and the answer really depends on you if you are living in sin you absolutely have a right to be afraid of a holy God. You hear me? If you, uh, you know, the Bible, the Bible says all over um, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin, the payment for sin is death. Uh, Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, you know the verse? After that, judgment. So, so, so am I supposed to be afraid of a holy God? Well, it depends on you. Really, if you study scripture, like if you're living in sin, you better, I mean, you better believe it. You, you absolutely have a right to be afraid of, of him. Uh, in Deuteronomy, God says this. The Bible says, uh, Deuteronomy 13, 4 says, Serve only the Lord your God and fear him only that should uh, alone fear him alone i can't read to them sorry guys uh serve only the lord your god and fear him alone there's a lot of things in my life that i fear you know i there there sometimes there's been times when i fear finances there's times when i fear uh, a health situation there are times when there i fear the 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 unknown future and God looks at you and he looks at me and he says, look, if you're going to fear anything, fear God. Serve only the Lord your God and fear him alone. Nothing else. Nothing else. Obey his commands. Listen to his voice and cling to him. So we're going to talk about this whole idea of fear, the fear of the Lord. What does that mean? What, does, what is Mary, like as a young um, a girl what is she trying what can we learn from her when she says when she utters those words in the middle of that season where nothing made sense when she says god will show you mercy in fact she's actually quoting from deuteronomy this is a quote from deuteronomy chapter 5 where god says i lavish my unfailing love from generation to generation to all who fear him so mary is actually she knows scripture and she's pulling out a verse from the old testament and she and she's quoting what god had said and so what is what is this talking about the fear of god from generation to generation well here's kind of um, how i like to think of it okay when i thought of these verses 
sort of an illustration to help, help us kind of understand this. Do you remember the story when Jesus was on the cross and the two individuals that he had next to each other, laying next to him? Do you remember what, what they, their profession, what they categorized us? What were they? They were what? They were thieves. Remember that, that story? And, and you have one thief, and I can't remember if he was on his right or his left, but you have one thief, and he's saying um, to Jesus, he's kind of reflecting onto him. He's, he's insulting him. He's, you know, cursing. And he's, he's kind of mocking him. And the, and the one thief, he's like, oh, you, you know, you say that you are the son of God. If you're, the, if you're really the son of God, why don't you get yourself down from this, from this cross? Remember this story? You guys, you've, you've heard it before, right? Um, and he's going like, you know, they had put um, over Jesus' head, they put the king of the Jews. And so the one thief is going, you know, if, you, if you're saying that you're the king of the Jews, why don't you command these people to get you down from, I mean, you, you're no king. What are you talking about? Do you remember what the other thief said in that moment? He looks, thank you, buddy, I appreciate it. Somebody's raising their hand. I love that, love that. You remember what the other thief said? He said, wow, don't you even fear God? I think it's a great question for us to ask ourselves. Do I fear, Lord, and do I? Because I know there's times when I don't know if I fear. Do I fear you? In order for us to receive the promise of mercy, what the Bible is saying here, what Mary is talking about during those strange, difficult times, is I have to learn to fear him. Listen to how God describes the world. Listen to these verses, okay? Romans chapter 3, verse 10. This is how God describes the world. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. As the scripture says, no one is righteous. No, not even one. Verse 13, their talk is foul. Like this picture, this is incredible. Like how God just puts his word picture for us. Like the stench from an open grave. Okay, this is God describing the world. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Verse 14, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Verse 16, destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. The world is looking for peace. This is why I encourage you, man, whatever you do, invite someone to a Christmas. You know, I've heard that 8 out of 10 people will say yes to you coming with you to a candlelight service like a Christmas Eve service if you just invite them. Eight out of ten people, especially in East Texas. And so the world is looking for this kind of peace. It's a, God says, when I describe the world, here's how I see it. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They're lost. And then verse 18, they have, say a church, they have no fear. Of God at all no fear so here's what I want to do next 10 minutes I want to share with you three ideas about fearing God okay in the strangest of seasons the truth is that is that fearing God makes you fearless fearing God makes you fearless in the face of adversity in the face of the unknown in those strange seasons where you can't really pinpoint why you feel the way you feel, like you feel like there's a, the whole, the whole, I mean, this huge thing, and like, I just don't know how to feel it. I feel, I don't feel satisfied, and I'm healthy, and I have a job, and life is good, but I still, like, there's just something that I cannot, I don't know what to tell. I go to church, I serve, I pray, I read my Bible, but there is just, I just don't understand it. So three ideas about fearing God. Number one, here's what I wrote down on my notes. When you fear God, you decide in advance to stand, to stand for God. When you fear God, you decide ahead of time that you're gonna, no matter what happens, no, no matter what comes your way, you're gonna stand for Him. This is what tithing is all about. Now, I know anytime I mention tithing, it's like, oh, you know, you kind of feel that you know, that a little bit uncomfortable, okay? What tithing is, is saying, God, 
I'm so thankful that you provided for, for my family, that you provided for me. You've given me the brains. You've given me the talent. You've given me the gift. And God, before I do it again, I'm going to honor you. I'm going to fear you. I'm going to put you first. And so listen, if you're a teenager here today and you work and you make $100 a week or whatever, you should take a portion of what God's given you because God's the one that provides that for you and you should dedicate it to him. That's what fear is all about. Fear is, when you, fearing God is, is what we're going to do today. Is we're going to have baptisms today. And it's like, yeah, yeah, man, let's give it up. For, I love that. And, and today, I'm going to give you a chance to stand for God. Some of you have signed, signed up for baptism. Some of you, you're here, and you're like, oh, I already know the Lord's Spirit came to me. But how am I going to do this? I'm not ready. I didn't have, I didn't pack a change of clothes. And I wasn't planning on doing this, but I really feel like God's speaking to me. Listen, one of the things that we love to do is to, um, to uh, get, to be ready, okay, ahead of time, so that when God speaks to you, you have no excuses. And so I told the team, hey, could you please buy some t-shirts? Could you please buy some shorts? We need some towels. We even bought hair dryers and like disposable makeup. It's like, can we think of anything else that they could use as an excuse not to get baptized? <laughs> All right? And so today at the end of the service, I believe God will speak to you like he spoke to the people in our last service. And I believe that some of you are going to say, you know what, I am ready to take a stand for God ahead of time because you don't need to wait until you're in the mess tomorrow. You don't need to wait until the, your trial comes to stand for him. You need to stand when you hear him, when he says, today is the day. That's the moment that you say, okay, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey. I'm going to follow through, God, whatever you do. God, whatever you say. And the question is, do you fear men or do you fear God? Because one of the biggest fears, I've been where you are, this is how I know. One of the biggest fears is what will they think? What will they say? Well, let me tell you what we will think, what we will say. We're going we're gonna to be your biggest cheerleaders. We're going to be clapping for you. You know, no, no fingers. Like, we're, we're, we're going to celebrate. The Bible says that heaven is throwing a party on your behalf. And so if you think that we're going to be pointing fingers to judge you, oh, I wonder what they did. Man, you, you've, we, you're at the, you know, like this is not that kind of church, okay? And so Mary put her faith in God before she was tested. The words that she utters out of her mouth, they don't just come because, because like just out of nowhere. No, she had already years before, she had already put her faith before she had to deal with the strange season of her life. The time to choose your loyalty is before the test happens. You're not supposed to be like a chameleon. Have you ever seen a chameleon? What do they do? They blend, they blend in. As Jesus followers, we do hard things. We stand out. You know, when I challenge you to tithe, that's not an easy thing for me as a pastor to do. Like, I'm telling you, like, this is, this is, we do hard things as Jesus followers. You think it's easy to get up in front of everybody and get baptized? Holy cow, that's hard. I know I'm not asking you to do something that's easy. I get it. I, I'm with you. And some, some of you, because I, I know this, I've done it enough, some of you right now, this very moment, you're shaking you're like, holy cow, he's really putting it on, you know? But listen, don't let me play the Holy Spirit. I don't want to twist your arm, okay? If it's not the right time, I understand. But if God is speaking to you, this is the time, okay? And so when you, you know, how do I know, like, what, you know, fear in God, you truly fear God when you decide in advance to stand for God. Do you think it was easy for Mary to stand for God? When her son is on the cross and she's at the foot of the cross, man, that was none of that was easy. Number two, never stop asking for wisdom. When you fear God, you never stop asking for wisdom. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Of wisdom. Say it, say it with me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. wisdom. The fear of 
of the Lord is the starting point for you to get wisdom. Get, get this. The, the God that we serve, he sees the beginning of times and the end of times all at the same time. How could that be? Well, he's, that's why we call him God, okay? You need wisdom from this God for your life, in every area of your life. And so how do you, how do you gain wisdom from him? Well, by using your mind for him by developing your mind, by protecting your mind. You're not going to let your mind go in directions or things that it shouldn't go because it is, you want to have the mind of Christ. You want to fear God with your mind. The Bible says, Proverbs 23, verse 12, commit yourself to instruction. Listen carefully to the words of knowledge. Knowledge is important in your life. It's good that you're here. I applaud you for showing up on a call Sunday morning. <laughs> you know, I woke up this morning. It's like, oh, Lord, are you sure you want us to do baptisms today? It's like 29 or something. You know, like, are you sure? Like, I really don't want to get in that. You know, it's cold today. I'm sure you woke up and you thought the same thing, right? Like, oh, Lord, you really want me to? It's good that you gain knowledge and insight from God's word. Bible also says, Wise people, watch this, and this is you, I'm preaching to the choir. Wise people treasure knowledge, but the babbling of a fool invites disaster. They're both important, knowledge and wisdom, they're both important. You need them both. You want to su succeed in life? You need knowledge, you need wisdom. Knowledge is basically information that you gain from experience. Uh, and, and education, okay? So you go to school to gain knowledge, to gain information. Wisdom is seeing and responding to all of your life situations from God's point of view, okay? So when you look at a relationship in your life, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, somebody that you're engaged to, you know, when you look at them the way that God would look at them, and when you respond to that relationship the way God would respond to, to that relationship, then God says you're being wise, Okay, you can be very knowledgeable. You know everything there is to know about re relationships, and you can listen to podcasts and read books on relationships, and you can, I mean, gain tremendous knowledge, fill up your head with all this knowledge. But that does not automatically mean that you're wise. There's a difference. You need both. You need knowledge. You need wisdom. Wisdom you get from God. Mary had both. If you read this passage, Mary, like she's quoting scripture. Like if you read the whole, if you study the whole thing, it's like one verse after the next. She's like quoting from the Old Testament. She's got lots of knowledge. But she didn't just have knowledge. She had wisdom because she was able to see all of the set of strange circumstances that was in front of her. And she was able to react to them the right way. The way that God would have reacted. And so... I know people who have lots of letters after their names, lots of degrees. They're not exempt from making stupid decisions because you can have knowledge, but you, that does not guarantee wisdom. Well, how was Mary so, how, you know, how did she have knowledge and wisdom? What was, the, what was the key? It was the fear of God. That's why she's quoting this verse. And so when you fear God, you decide in advance to stand for God you never stop asking for wisdom. And then we, last thing is you walk with people who make you spiritually stronger. Uh, all the translations that I read, they use similar words. You know, she hurried, she ran after the angel came to her, to her, to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And I think the reason, I, I think Mary did this. God gave her insight. She did this at an early age. And I don't think it was, I, I think it was intentional. She went after the people who she knew were the strongest, most spiritual people in her life. When she didn't understand her world, she, she was not just hanging out with just your average show. She's like, I'm going to go after the strongest, the people who have the strongest possible relationship with God, which was Elizabeth and Zechariah. And look, I'm not saying that God doesn't want you to have friends who are not, who are not believers. That's not what I'm saying. Actually, I'm saying... That, the opposite, um, especially this Christmas season, like it's good that you have friends that are not believers. I mean, how would you share the gospel, right? If all of your friends were believers, right? So God wants you to love them. He wants you to 
speak life into them, offer them hope. Like, no, no that's a no-brainer. Um, but but I, what I think it's important for you to know is don't settle for less, okay? Your best friends, the people that you hang out with the, mo- the most, your, whether it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, somebody you engage, like these should be some of the strongest people that you hang out with, spiritually speaking. A lot of times what we do, because it's hard, I get it, I understand, okay, I'm, I'm with you. It's hard because like, man, you don't know. It's hard to find people, in, you know, that are, that are committed to the Lord. I, I get it. But often what we do is we lose hope and we just settle, we lower the bar. God doesn't want you to lower the bar. God wants your closest friends to be strong believers. And I'll tell you why. The reason why is because God is a problem for a lot of people in the world. That's really what it is. He gets in their way. A a holy God doesn't tolerate sin. A holy God is not going to make you feel comfortable if you're living in sin. And so as we kind of wrap up the whole message today... To fear Him is to stand for Him ahead of time. It's to seek Him and to ask Him for wisdom so you can become more like Him. It's to find people. I'm so glad that you're here because um, in church often you find the people of like-minded faith. But to fear Him means that you're going to find people that help you, keep you accountable. That's what fearing God is all about. You honor Him, you obey Him, you yield to Him, you follow Him, you worship Him, you walk with Him. And so I have a question for you today. Do you fear God? Or is he someone that you just talk about? Is he someone that you just pray to in case of an emergency? Is he just someone that you just ask for a favor when you're in trouble? Do you fear God? Or you just come to him maybe once a year, twice a year, Christmas, Easter. Fearing God makes us fearless in the strangest of situations. The secret sauce to Mary's spiritual life was her fear for God. I believe with all of my heart, that's why God chose her. She had a holy, healthy fear for God. So we're going to wrap up the service, and I'm, this is what we're going to do. It's a little bit different than usually, but I really believe God's speaking to some of you. I'm going to ask all of you, would you stand up? Everybody stand up. Don't move yet. Don't go anywhere. Volunteers, you guys hang in there, okay? And with heads bowed and eyes closed, everybody standing, heads bowed, eyes closed. If you are a believer and you have never gotten baptized, let me speak to you for a moment. If you're in this room and you're a believer, you've never gotten baptized, you need to stand for God today. You need to honor Him. And the question is, will you fear man or will you fear God? If you're here and you still have questions, maybe you're not a believer, that's all good with us, no problem. We understand. You don't have to be like us. You don't have to believe what we believe in order for us to love on you. But if for any chance, like God is speaking to you right now, you don't have to go through a class to believe in Him. You don't, you don't even have to go through me. Like, I don't even need to know. I'm not your priest. I'm your friend. And God's word tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So it's a pretty simple thing. You don't need a whole big, huge, long thing. All God's asking is, you believe me? You believe that I sent my son for you? You believe that I have the power to raise him from the dead? Yes, Lord, I do. I believe it. I know you can, you can do that. I feel it in my heart. That's it. You're saved. Boom. Done. Check. And so if you are here today and you're like, God, I just, I really want to, I want to show everybody 
That's what baptism is. Putting on the Jesus jersey. So, in a few seconds, this is going to be your chance to fear God, to stand for Him. You can do it in a few minutes when we take the tithe. Maybe you have not been tithing and you know that God wants you to put Him first in that area of your life. Well, you can take care of that pretty quickly. The question is, are you going to be more afraid of your finances or of God? And so if you want to get baptized today, here's what we're going to do. Everybody look this way real quick, real quick, real quick. I'm almost done. If you want to get baptized, I'm going to make it super simple, okay? I'm going to pray. Nobody moves while I pray. After we're done praying, okay, if you want to take that step, whether you're ready or not, even if you didn't sign up, it's all good. We, we got you covered, okay? Trust us, okay? What you're going to do is you're going to take a step forward after I'm done praying. When I say G in Jesus' name, amen. If you want to get baptized, you're going to come this way. Our volunteers are going to be over here, okay? And we're going to celebrate. And this is going to be, I want you to be the craziest people you've been in church. I'm giving you permission. Every person, when they come down, because it represents life before and after, right? It means that you're dying to your sins and you have a Savior that's bringing you back up. And the Bible says that heaven is rejoicing. Heaven is celebrating on your behalf. And so I don't want just heaven to celebrate. I want to celebrate. And so we're going to applaud. We're going to cheer. We're going to cry. We're going to yell. But first, let's pray. Okay? With heads bow and eyes closed. Lord, you know our hearts, God. God, you know everybody that's in this room. God, thank you that you challenge us like the message today, God. We don't want to play games with our faith. God, it's either real or it's not. It's cosmetic or it's deep. God, thank you for challenging us, challenging us to fear you. God, I pray that if there's anybody here thinking about getting baptized, but they're afraid of the fear of man, God, I pray that they would fear you more. Thank you for putting baptism, the test of baptism, in front of us, in front of our faces so as a way to see who's really serious and who's not, who's willing to go public and who's not. God, help us. Help your people in this church do a soul surge, God. For those watching online or listening, God, I pray that we would be just as engaged. God, those who are not honoring you with their finances, God, I pray that they would fear you more. God, make us honest people. Give us the courage, God. Give us the courage, like Mary. We ask for miracles, Lord. And we trust. We trust that you're about to do a few miracles in this place. And we celebrate your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you want to get baptized, this is your time. You guys come this way. Let's, let's celebrate all the people that are going to get baptized, church. Come on, let's put our hands together. This is your chance. If you want to get baptized, come on. Come on over. This is your chance. So proud of you. Keep coming. Come on. Come on. This is your chance. Come on, church. Anyone else? Don't put it off. This is a first step of obedience. Anyone else? Come on, church. Let's, let's keep clapping for them. Let's celebrate. Yeah. Come on, church. Anyone else? I love it. I love it. Love it. You guys come. 